I want you to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 17. John's Gospel, 17. At the beginning of Missions Month, I want to talk to you about mission. I'm going to do this by reminding you that our God is a missionary. Well, what I mean by that, he is the sending God. And Jesus, who said to the Father in the prayer we're about to read, he says, Father, as you have sent me, so I'm sending them into the world. Let's see what God has to say. And I'm going to read from verse 18. And uh, it was pointed out to me that my Bible version, NLT, is a little different from what's on the screen. It's just uh, a few words here and there which are different, but uh, it's all still the same word of God. I'm reading from the NLT version, John chapter 17, verse 18. And this is the prayer of Jesus. We're picking it up at the climax of the prayer. As you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself entirely to you, so they also might be entirely yours. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one, just as you and I are one, Father. That just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are, I and them and you and me, all being perfected into one. Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you've given me to be with me so they can see my glory. You gave me the glory because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know that you sent me and I have revealed you to them and will keep on revealing you. I will do this so that your love for me may be in them and I in them. What an amazing prayer. You know, I don't believe you ever really get to know somebody until you pray with them. And you never really know their heart until you've heard them open their heart in prayer. That's why prayer fellowship is so important throughout this month of mission. Don't forget we've got a prayer diary so we can pray together and see God do glorious things across the world. That prayer diary will also be available online. And when Jesus prays this prayer to the Father, read all of it today, there's your homework. We started at verse 18, but it's a wonderful prayer. And the recurring themes are already obvious even from the passage we selected. It's all about glory, unity, love, joy, purity, separation from the world, holiness, and being sent into the world, mission. Way back in 1986, I had the privilege of pioneering what was to become very much the norm for all of us in Kensington Temple, pioneering the first short-term mission on behalf of Kensington Temple. And I was sent back into Africa. I was born in Africa. God gave me the privilege of not going to East Africa first, but to West Africa. Unfortunately, it was at West, not East, but at least it was Africa and Sierra Leone. And then in 1987, I led a mission team into my birthplace, Kenya. And we focused on the area where my father was born, Nakuru. And we saw amazing things, signs and wonders and miracles and many, many hundreds of people saved. And I want to tell you, we, we came back different, different people. And that's why our desire is that at, at least once in your time in Kensington Temple, you will go with us on a short-term mission. 
It changes you, not just to say you've got to catch an aeroplane in order to speak for Jesus, but that when you go and see God work, you want to bring back that fire, that glory, that faith, that passion, and that, and that evangelistic passion back into your own life in London. So that's what it's all about. We, we welcome people. We are a church that welcomes people, but we're also a church that sends people. And our big desire is to prepare you for the mission field. The Bible says the field is the world, which means, first of all, your world, your world. And we want to prepare you for your world. What is your world? Well, it's where you live, where you work, where you study, so that we can prepare you to be effective for Jesus out there in the marketplace, which is the mission place for all of us. And then, of course, as the circle of influence increases to the very ends of the earth. And all of this is based on on God himself. He is the great sending God. He is the ever living, ever giving, and ever sending God. Think about that for a moment. Here in these passages, we read in the prayer of Jesus how he speaks so often about his relationship with the Father. Of course, in in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, This tells us this was happening even before the world began, which means that forever and ever and ever, God was a sending God. The Father sends forth His love and reaches out towards the Son, and the Son receives that love and sends love back to the Father, ever sending, in communion, ever reaching out, and the Holy Spirit who goes between the Father and the Son, flowing between them is the Spirit of fellowship, the Spirit of love, and the Spirit of mission. And that happened even before the world was created. But then God said, I am going to extend my missionary plan. It's not just going to be something we share together, Father, Son, and Spirit, but I'm going to share this with the whole world. Ha, but wait a bit, the world was not yet created. So God said, okay, I'm going to create the world. Let's pause for a moment. I want to quote to you a passage in the Bible. Write it down, look at it later. Very important verse, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. And it helps us at just a point like this where we are trying to imagine and enter in to sometimes the very secrets of God. And the Bible says that the secret things belong to God. There's stuff that we don't understand, stuff that is not revealed, but it goes on to say what he has revealed belongs to us. We can only imagine what God's purpose was. We know that in creating the universe, He was wanting to display his glory. He was creating creatures, both spiritual and physical creatures, the angels, in communion with him, apart from those that rebelled and sinned and became demons. And the human creation, God's purpose was to display his glory, but there is an aspect of the revelation of God that we can lay hold of. It's very clearly revealed. God's desire was to expand his family and say, I'm going to have a very big family and we're all going to share in the same spirit of love and unity and glory and communion and community and that is how I'm going to express my love through you and define my love. So God says, okay, I extend my family. So there's only Father, Son and Spirit, so I'm going to make the universe. And when he made the universe, God did not go over the top. But if his plan and purpose was to raise a family, truly speaking, he didn't need this massive universe. But he did. He's lavish in his creation. And a certain part of the universe is our galaxy with a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And there one star perfectly placed our sun and in perfect relationship with that star is our earth where the conditions for life as we know it are perfectly fine-tuned. God did all of that to express his loving care. And when he did it, he sent forth his word. You see, the sending God. The first thing he did was send forth his word. In the beginning, God created by saying, let there be, and there was. He sent forth his word. But he didn't leave the world empty. 
He said, I'm not just going to send my word, I'm going to send my spirit into the world. And that's amazing. It's picked up in the very early verses of Genesis. We can all quote it together, I'm sure. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth. And what does it say? And the Spirit of God was brooding like a hen brooding over its eggs, brooding over the world. So God said, I'm not going to leave my world empty. It's going to be full of my glory. So I've sent my word, I send my spirit, and God's spirit has never left. Wonderful. Which means that this world is charged with the glory of God. And uh, this is where the artist in me comes out. And I think about the metaphysical poets. One of the chief ones is a believing Christian is Gerard Manley Hopkins. And uh, he was an Anglican and he was born in Stratford in Essex, that center of world poetry, as we all know, uh, in Stratford. And, uh, uh, and he converted to Roman Catholicism. And he became a Jesuit priest. And, and when he converted to Roman Catholicism, he burnt all his poems. He said, my life up until now does not count. In fact, he probably found a deeper relationship with God. I, I'm not making any theological points. I'm just talking about this man's heart in searching after God. He burnt all his poems and he said, I'm only going to write for God. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to write for God. And I'm going to quote from one of his most beautiful poems called God's Grandeur, written in 1877. I won't read the whole poem. I'm going to resist the temptation. I don't want to get too artistic on you. And I'm going to make sure before the end of the service, there's a bit of science here for the rest of you as well. Okay, so the poem is called God's Grandeur. And he's making exactly the point that I'm making, that God's presence is everywhere in the world. If only we had eyes to see it. And he starts off by saying, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And he's using the, uh, a kind of metaphor. It's like electricity. God is personal, but his power is everywhere. Power in the world. God's presence, God's grandeur, everything is charged with the electrifying presence of God. Then in the poem, he starts talking about how we, humanity, have moved away from God and have not, can no longer discern him in creation is a kind of commentary on his day, which was the day of industrialization, the day of the big factories and mechanization, and, and people in cities were being kind of uh, remote, being a bit remote with nature. And he says, but nevertheless, God is still there. He hasn't left. His presence is still there. And then he ends with this line. The Holy Ghost, he says, over the bent world, broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. Here we have poetic recognition of biblical truth. But it's not just that God sent forth his word and sent forth his spirit into the world. The world as we know turned its back on God. And that might have been the end of the story. It might have been God said, well, okay, I gave you free will. So we could have relationship, but you've turned your back on me and that's the end of the story. He was not obligated to go any further. But God set his love on us once more. And then to save us, he did another sending. And you know what sending I'm talking about. It's the John 3, 16 sending. Let's quote it all together if we can, whatever version you have. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. The sending God. This time he sent God and he many, sent his son. In many ways, this is highly logical if you think about it. Because in this, we discover what love really is. What is love? Is it pink doilies, rosy cheeked cherubs, Cupid's shooting arrows. No, it is other-centeredness. The opposite of love is self-centeredness. But God is love. So his focus is totally on the other. The Father's love 
totally focused on the Son. The Son's love totally focused on the Father and God's love totally focused on us saying, I am so committed to you and what you need and I will deliver it whatever it costs me. That's why the Bible boldly declares the definition of love. This is how we know what love is. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son into the world. God says, I am prepared to love you infinitely and I don't care, I will pay whatever price it costs me to love you. And we know that God was true to his word because it cost him his one and only son who came into the world to be our savior. And of course, it didn't end on the cross. He was raised again from the dead. And then when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he, he's given that glorious position, seated on at the right hand of the Father on the throne of the universe, the executive governing authority in the hands of the Son, and the first act of his executive position at the right hand of God was to do another sending. Sending the Holy Spirit, not this time just to be God's everywhere presence in the world, but to be God's personal presence in our hearts, the indwelling Spirit of God. And you know, this is a truth, whether we are conscious of it or not. I'm sure there are times in your life when you are more conscious of God's presence than at other times. But as believers who rest on the authority of Scripture, whether we feel Him or we don't feel Him, we know He's here. He said, I'll never leave you. So He's going to keep His promise. But there are times when we, somehow God, God kind of lifts the veil a little bit. There's a time I want to share with you many years ago, again on mission. It's amazing how when you go and focus on the real job of reaching souls, how God will reveal himself to you. He, he who calls you will always equip you. And there I was in Brazil. From that day even to this day, I might be in the most beautiful place. Recently, I, I, in April, I was in Rio de Janeiro. And from my hotel room, I could see Coca Cabana Beach and Pina Colada Beach. I never visited either. <laughs> yeah, okay. But I stayed in the hotel because I'm seeking God. And it was such a time as that, this time years ago, I was in Sao Paulo, and we were holding big mission services in the evening, and we were seeing wonderful miracles. Some people on the staff today were with me during that time. They can testify to the miracles that we saw and the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people who were saved. And it was glorious. So here was my day. Wake up, of course, take a little breakfast, shut myself in my hotel room. Nobody disturbed me apart from Michelle sending me a fax about, do we do this in the revival time? Tick, cross, tick, send it back, concentrate on God. That's all I did. And in those days, seeking God for me was kind of a protracted thing. Uh, you know, I couldn't just settle things in five minutes. I, I found it took a whole hour for me to stop focusing on my physical condition. Oh, I'm a bit tired, I've got a sore back, my knees are sore, that kind of stuff. A whole hour thinking, and then breaking into the next level where I'm thinking, oh yeah, but I, well, I'm, feel, I'm, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. So when you've dealt with the body and, and you start to break free from your, the restrictions of your soul and your thought processes and your emotional position at that particular time into the third hour, now we're starting to flow and we're experiencing presence of God and flowing with the Holy Spirit and out of that comes the word, the message and the anointing and the intercession for the day and then there's a knock on the door, it's time to go, the car is waiting. So I say, I have to refresh myself. So I go into the bathroom, clean my teeth, doesn't take long for, to fix myself because my philosophy is you can't improve upon perfection. But anyway, <laughs> here am I, 
And then suddenly, when my mind is on my physical appearance, my mind is on, is my tie straight? When I'm thinking about that, something happens. God's background presence moves forward just a smidgen, just a tiny, tiny, tiny decimal point of a tiny percentage. And everything's transformed. I've been in the presence of God for more than three hours. And I would have thought, that's it. There's nothing more to be had. But in a space of 10 seconds, everything stopped. It was as if time stood still. And this thought flood to my mind as I experience a level of God's presence that I've rarely experienced from that time even to this. It was as if God's everywhere presence suddenly came closer. As if the sun, our own sun, which shines brightly, had moved a bit closer and I could feel its effects. And my thoughts were like this. Wow, this is what heaven must be like. And my second thoughts were, whatever you have to go through in life, whatever suffering, whatever pain, whatever agony you go through, it's not worth comparing with this. Give me this. And then it's over. Going to the service, I haven't time to tell you amazing things. Jesus came and stood right there in the midst of us. It was absolutely amazing. So I'm saying is this, is that we have to develop this attitude of waiting on God and being so pleased that he will manifest his presence. And here comes some science to help us understand exactly how powerful this is. Do you know our sun, which is 93 million miles away, 150 kilometers more or less away from us, taking eight minutes for the light traveling at 186,000 miles per second to reach us. If the sun came just a little bit closer, three percentage points closer, there would be chaos on this planet. Certain things would be, we, we would find it very hard to live. And that shows us how amazing God is, how finely tuned our universe is. Science websites tell us that there are around 75 finely tuned factors that if any one of those went outside of certain variables, life on this planet would not be as we know it. It would not be habitable for us. 75 of them, including the position of our galaxy in the universe, the position and distance of the earth from the sun, the angle of the earth's tilt on its axis, uh, and the rate of uh, revolution on its axis, 24 hours, if any of these things varied by any tiny degree, life would be impossible. In fact, they've calculated the probability of these 75 factors within the parameters of survival of life on Earth. And they have discovered through mathematics and probability that the probability of us existing on earth under those conditions is one in 10 to the power of 99. And there are only a maximum number of planets in the universe 10 to the power of 23. In other words, that's one of the biggest proofs that there is a loving God who created us and we're not living in an empty universe. And the sun's power itself, for this is amazing. I don't have to work on this because David Wellington, our former staff member, not only was he a musician, but he was a scientist. He said, Colin, I'll give you some ways of explaining this. I knew that the earth through research, that the sun rather, produces 386 billion, billion megawatts of power. So are you gonna say hallelujah to that? Well, it's, it's inconceivable. And so he said, what you need to explain is that every second, every second, the sun produces enough energy to meet the current energy needs of our planet for 500,000 years. Let's do an experiment. Are you ready? You can count second, can't you? I know how to do it. One, one thousand, two, one, that's another 500,000 years. Three, one thousand, another 500,000 years. 
all that power. And even that's a little bit out there, isn't there? Let me put it even more practically in terms of what you and I do almost every day of our lives. Boil a kettle of water. David Wellington calculated it for me and said, every second our sun produces enough power for us, every one of us on this planet, to boil a kettle of water continuously for 160 million years. That's an awful lot of tea that we can make. So that shows us the immense power, and that's just some kind of mathematical, scientific calculation to understand physical power. Imagine what it means that the God who created all those things, His power is living within us. And that means nothing is impossible as we seek to follow Him. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within us, He creates fellowship, the Holy Spirit, you know, the grace, which we, the last verse of Second Corinthians, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Remember that? The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Spirit, God's Spirit lives in us. Fellowship is created, and it's more than fellowship. Community is created because it is God sharing with us the life, the unity, the fellowship, the love that existed between Father, Son, and Spirit of all eternity. And the same motivation applies. It's the same movement. God doesn't just reveal Himself to us for our own sakes. Jesus did not die just for our sins, but for the sins of the world. The community of God is a missionary community. It is an outreach community. Yes, first, we must have community, but... That community doesn't exist for itself. It exists for those beyond. That's why Jesus prays to the Father in John 17, verse 18. And we're over here, and we're meant to over here. We're eavesdropping on a prayer that's been recorded for our understanding and for our knowledge of what we are about and why we are here and what does it mean to be here on a Sunday morning? What does it mean to be meeting in our cell groups throughout the week? What does it mean to be participating in the Giants program so that we can reach out effectively through cell meetings in the marketplace to bring the message of the glory of God to a wider community. John 17, verse 18. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm going to add some words here, even so. Can you see how that's implied? Just as, even so. I am sending them into the world. We continue the movement of God. The sending God has entered our lives and we can't stand still. We've got to be sent he sends forth His Word. He sends forth His Spirit. He sends forth His Son. And He fills us with that same sending Spirit. And now we cannot but be sent into the world. But how does this happen? John 17 verse 21 says, Here's Jesus praying. For this to be effective, for this to work, this prayer has to be answered. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. This is the kind of fellowship that the Father and His Son enjoyed together, this unity coming together, touching of one to the other. That is the level of fellowship that's necessary for us to be at one. And then he goes on to say this extraordinary statement. And may they be in us. Not just God in us, but us in God. In other words, we are brought up into this wonderful community, enjoying the overflow of the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, when that happens, the world will believe that you sent me. This is a vision. First of all, it means by the Holy Spirit learning to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to be so passionate in our response to God 
to respond to his love when he sent his son into the world for us to say, yes, I believe it is for whoever believes. I believe, I accept your love. I accept that Jesus died for me, that he is who he said he was. He is the son of God. Only that can come by the revelation of the spirit. But then I give my life in worship and adoration to God. But that's not the end of the story because as soon as the love of God operates in our hearts, the second commandment kicks in, not just love for God, but to love your neighbor as yourself, beginning with your closest neighbors, those of the Christian faith. And when we build that kind of loving community, we glorify God and the light shines and people say, what is it that you've got? We need it. So our great purpose is to bring glory to God by continuing his mission, the adventure he started from before the creation of the world and when he made us to reflect it into the world and when he saved us that we can in our redeemed life learn how to demonstrate the heavenly love of God in our earthly relationships and the power of the Spirit. That's why we in Kensington Temple live and breathe mission. It's our raison d'etre, which I'm sure you understand uh, even in English. It's a borrowed term from the French. And that means we are called to be a community of God's people who know God <laughs> and who know God through one another and love God and love God through one another and to demonstrate to the world what love looks like so they can see what God looks like and know that he truly sent his son. So the practical point, this is your take home point. This is in a, in a bag that you take home with you and you unpack in the cell meetings in this week. This is it. God is calling us to connect with one another. Not just individually and personally, but in loving community not just a handful of people, but all of us connected with each other in, and demonstrate the community of love. And in that way, we will show Christ to the world. Cell leaders, I've written it down for you at some points. Be emailing you later today. Pick this up in the cells. He is the sending God. He sent his word. He created the world. He sent his spirit. He sent his son to save the world. And he sent his spirit again to bring us back into his plan. So this all rests on the nature of God himself. If he is ascending God and he sent us, how can we but respond and say, Father, I'm going to go. I'm going to cross the road to my neighbor. I'm going to cross the office to speak to somebody. I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not going to waste the office time by bringing Bible texts and pasting them around the room. I'm going to do it with wisdom. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them God's love. And they're going to see something reflected in me, and not just in me as an individual, but in my cell group as I invite them. And they say, who are these people? Look how they love one another. What's happening here? And we have to say, very simply, it's God. That's what's happening. God is manifesting himself. Let's pray. I've got two prayers to pray that I would like to pray. The first prayer is for somebody, anybody, many people, who have never yet personally responded to God's love. It's a salvation call. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's just be in his presence right now. Don't think about anything else but God's presence. There, ha there has to come a moment, my friend, when having heard the good news, you respond to it and say, I want to join the family of God. I want to have my relationship with God healed. I want to know what it means to have peace with God. I want to know what it means to have the love of God working in my life. I need your love. And I receive it today. I'm going to pray a prayer in which you, perhaps for the first time in your life, clearly, intentionally invite Christ to be your Savior. 
Say, he's come, he's died, I accept that. Now I want to acknowledge that and I want him to save me. Not just be the savior of the world, but be my savior. I want to personalize it today. If that's you, here's a prayer that I want you to pray. We're going to all pray it out loud to help you, but it'll be especially for you today. If you say, I want to know God's love. I want Christ in my life. Here's the prayer. Are you ready? Pray it after me loud and strong, everybody. Lord Jesus Christ. Pray it stronger than that. Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you now. And I acknowledge that in you, I find the love of God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. And I now invite you to be my personal Savior, that I might become a member of God's family and His community of love. Thank you, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Before I move on to the second prayer, I want to acknowledge all those today who are praying that for the first time and saying, Jesus, I want you in my life. We have something to give you. We have something to share with you. But if today you say, I prayed that prayer for the first time and I want you to pray for me, Colin, because I really do want Jesus in my life. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, nobody moving around, just lift your hand right where you are and I'll pray for you and somebody will stand with you and give you a free gift right now to help you grow. If this is you, lift your hand right now. Say, yes, I want Jesus in my life today. Let me see your hand. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. All over this building. If you do not know Jesus and you want to know him, lift your hand high. Thank you. God bless you up in the balcony. God bless you. If it's just for you, it's great. But there are others here. Lift your hand if you want Christ in your life. Lift your hand right now. Thank you. God bless you to my right. I can't drag this on, but I want to give you the opportunity for the last time of asking. If it's you, you need Jesus in your life. Lift your hand right now. We'll pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you for these people who've responded and others in the different parts, downstairs in the lower hall, out in the world of the internet. Anybody saying, Christ Jesus, come into my life. I pray for them now. Make it real, make it real, make it real. Let them know, let the love of God flood their hearts with assurance and joy. And we say in Jesus' name, welcome into the family of God. all to stand. Jesus' prayer, Father, as you sent me into the world, so I'm sending you. I want you, don't do it physically, but I want you to imagine what's going to happen in a few moments' time when we dismiss you. You're going to turn around and go out the doors into the week of your world. with pride, godly pride, that you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. He's sending you. For you, it might just be go back to your family and say, I'm sorry. Or it could be to make a telephone call today or an email. It could be tomorrow to speak to that person that God has been talking you to speak to about Jesus in a way that is with wisdom by the Holy Spirit. It could be to receive a new sense of God's commission on your life and a sense of His touch and His power as you go into difficult circumstances. But you are light sent into darkness to shine. You are lamb sent into a pack of wolves to be protected but to show the love of Jesus. You are salt sent into corruption that you might begin to influence for Jesus. With you need the power gave you a picture, a tiny picture of the power that's available. We talked about the power, the physical, energetic power of the Son. Imagine the power of the Son of God who is in your life. Nothing's impossible. Only He can convince of sin. Only He can draw people to Jesus. But that power is at work in you. Lift your hands right now. Begin to praise Him. Everybody, lifting your hands around it, would you please do that? It's just a sign of saying, God, here I am. I surrender to you. And in this moment, begin to receive from his hand. 
the overflowing of His love. Some of you, and I feel this very clearly, some of you are not yet convinced that God loves you. You say, I don't know, how do I know I'm not worthy? But that's the whole point. His love is unconditional and He has nailed His love literally to the cross and saying, I've proved it. Receive the fresh assurance that God loves you. His love is an inviting love, a healing love. It's a love that will bring you to your knees in repentance as you give your life afresh to Jesus, hearing, I am not of this world, but I am sent into this world. That's the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. And that is the enabling power of the Holy Spirit for you to be effective in your place of work. Don't ever give up on, on anybody. I've been witnessing to somebody for eight years and more, even this week in France. Not even a, any hint of an outward indication that they are closer to Jesus than eight years ago. I'm not giving up because I believe that God's love is an everlasting love. And if we keep on loving and keep on sharing and keep on blessing and keep on demonstrating God to the world, something will happen. There can be a turnaround in the spiritual realm. Don't give up on your backslidden family. Don't give up on your God-resistant workmates. Don't give up on them. Love them. Love them. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural love. All this is available right now. Lift your hands in His presence, everybody. Begin to pray in tongues, everybody, together. Tongues is nothing more than a prayer language. So we pray to God, spirit to spirit. Oh God, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. We worship you. We enjoy you. Oh God, turn our hearts towards one another in the love of God. Help us be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers. Let there be power released through the love of God that breaks down every barrier. Where there is hate, let us respond with love. Where there is hurt, let us respond with forgiveness. Where there is cursing, let us respond with blessing. For this is the love of God. Anoint us with the power of your Holy Spirit. We need your power. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we have nothing. Without you, we know nothing. Without you, we can do nothing. But we are not without you. We are in God and God is in us. Let the prayer of Jesus be answered in our hearts today. Pour out afresh your Holy Spirit. Let there be a release. And the love of God be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We go out in the name of Jesus. Keep on praying, keep on praying, keep on praying. Hallelujah. Somebody, somebody is witnessing to a person by the name of Agatha. I don't know who you are, I don't know where that person is in the world. But the word Agatha comes, the name Agatha comes very, very clearly to my ears. That is somebody that you're praying for, somebody that you're seeking to reach. Are we all going to pray for Agatha? Is there somebody here who say, I know that person, that per I'm praying for that person. Is there somebody here who would acknowledge that? Is there somebody here who will acknowledge that? Certain people are waving their hands, I don't know if they're just praising Jesus or saying yes to this. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 Agatha. Okay. Would you, is your sister, is it? Stretch your hands towards this lady. Stretch your hands towards this lady. And I want to say to you, as we pray for Agatha, who is not here, whose name has dropped supernaturally into my heart, as we pray for Agatha today, we let Agatha represent all the people around us that we love, we want to reach. Everybody praying right now. Lift up your hands, lift up your voice, everybody pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Agatha and all that Agatha represents. Draw Agatha closer to you. Reveal yourself to her afresh. Let all that she once knew of God be restored in her life.
draw her closer than ever before. Let the fire of God, let the agape of God touch Agatha. And the word Agatha means good, but let the love of God touch Agatha that her life will be made good and right for God. In the name of Jesus, we say, oh God, hear and answer our prayer. And for all the other Agathas in our lives, Agathas, mothers, brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, workmates, fellow students, best friends, let them through our lives hear the word of the testimony of truth set on fire by the Holy Spirit of love. Give Jesus a big praise everybody. Hallelujah. We're going to remain standing and we've got time. We've got time to stay around in the presence of God and so let's worship Him some more. Uh, they've chosen at least two great songs. The first song is about our mission recall. We're called in the name of Jesus and sent in the name of Jesus. Now you'll sing this song the second time this morning, but it will be with greater meaning because we've heard the message of God. Come on everybody, let's worship Him, let's celebrate Him, and let's be doers of the Word of God.
great song of celebration. Let's let it go, let it loose today, because we're happy to be in the presence of Jesus. We're in the kingdom of God where there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's see those clap. Let's see those smiley faces. Oh, no. 